It's a pleasure to be with you this morning to share my thoughts on the uh, outlook for the economy in 2018. I know that even last Friday, uh, Business Day had the economic outlook session that had in attendance uh, all the big names in economic analysis, including the Minister of Investment, the DG uh, Debt Management Office, uh, Patience Soniha, Bismarck, and the statistician of the Federation. Uh, they were all in attendance. Um, so uh, let me take a cue from what they have done so far. Actually, I would like to tweak the title a little bit. Uh, you know, asking a question because I want us, I want us to interact a little bit more on this. Um, can the momentum be sustained? It was all that took us uh, into the recession in 2015, and every person knows that it is oil that also brought us out of uh, the recession. So the Nigerian economy seems to be underwritten by oil price. How far can we go with that? I think that's the question that we need to ask because uh, everybody's happy now that things are turning around. And um, just simply because oil price has um, started going north. Um, yes, uh, yesterday I also read that Morgan Stanley Index, they are trying to um, enlist Nigeria once again. You know? So uh, with all those positive developments, it is important for us to ask has there been any real change, any fundamental change in the economic structure, or uh, is, is this still business as, as usual? I think it's, it is still business as usual, and I want to um, sustain that point. Now, if you look at the global trend, what is happening all over the world, for so many years we've seen that key interest rates in the rest of the world have been quite low, uh, hovering around one, sub-zero, I mean, sub-one, and, and so on. Um, like in the United States. But again, if the rate is hiked as they are planning, it means that we're going to experience a reversal of foreign portfolio investment into Nigeria. Now, what we realize also, in, as you will see also in my presentation, that um, foreign direct investment, when we look at capital importation into Nigeria, uh, foreign direct investment has de declined over the period uh, by as much as 19%. Uh, but foreign portfolio investment, you know, I'm sure that you can tell the difference between uh, direct investment and portfolio investment. When people invest in our assets, okay, uh, that is portfolio investment. But when they invest in um, real assets, they are building factories, running companies in Nigeria, that's direct investment. Now, that's declined by as much as 19% meaning that there was a noticeable deindustrialization, people closing up their shops, relocating factories out of Nigeria. But then, at the same time, we noticed that there was a hugely significant increase in the inflow of foreign portfolio investment. People are more interested in investing in our assets, investing in the capital markets. Okay, they bring in their money because they are looking for the high returns, so they want to make a quick, a quick win. So for them, our economy is no more than you know, something like MMM. And again, that increases the risk premium, okay, because um, uh, of the higher return they earn in Nigeria. That's why they are interested in coming here. Uh, they call it hot money, so we are highly susceptible to that. So if something happened in the United States and they feel that the interest rate in the United States, I mean, their assets or their investments uh, will be giving them better reward in the United States, immediately they will pull their, their, their monies, their investments in Nigeria, and we will know the implication that will have for our economy. So that is why we need to watch out for that. Now, electric cars are on the increase, of course. Um, we know what's been happening with oil price. Yes, uh, there is a resurgence in the, in, in, in the uh, direction of oil price trajectory, but um, structurally, we know that there have been so many, some new dynamics in the oil industry that things can no longer be as they were pre-2015. Um, a lot of emphasis on renewable, renewable energy, 
and that is beginning to yield fruit. And over the last period, uh, the, the, uh, the time oil was, was, uh, the oil price was weak, so many countries have actually uh, innovated new ways. Uh, you know, so a lot of improvements in, in renewable energy sources. So that will continue to challenge the dominance of oil. And as that happens, we know the implication it will have for our economy. Uh, not just that, electric cars and so on are coming up. You know, so if you've been following the trend, you see the Japanese also scaling up the technology that could uh, break um, the water molecules into the various constituents, uh, you know, uh, converting the hydrogen into kinetic energy. That is being scaled up in, in, in countries like Japan and even in the United States. So a whole lot of stuff is happening, meaning that there is a, a real threat to Nigeria's um, oil revenue, okay? If 51% of oil demand is for gasoline, and if electric cars continue to, you know, exert the force and the pressure they are doing today, we know that we are actually uh, trapped there. I mean, this is from looking at our economy from the outside, the outsider's view on the economy. What are the global implications of all this trend on our economy. Of course, the World Cup in, coming up in, 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 in Russia uh, later this year will have some significant impact in the markets as well. Then higher demand and supply of gas, impact on market prices will be negligible. Gas makes up 16% of export revenue. Now, if you look at the World Economic Forum, the titles uh, of, of their various uh, each year um, you can begin to understand the, the forces that have been dominating the world economy over the past five years. In 2014, it was the shaping of the world, consequences for society, politics, and business. And um, yes, the stability that we experience in oil production in the Niger Delta over the past few months. Okay, so uh, there is uh, improved liquidity in the market as well. Uh, we also need to understand that despite the fact that all the sectors of the economy went into recession, agriculture is a sole sector that didn't go into recession. Presco in 2016 had a profit margin of almost 771%. You know, people have been wondering, and the reason why I went in for that case, some CEOs wanted to know what drove that level of profitability for that industry. And it is not just uh, Presco, I think Okomo Oil also enjoyed similar growth profile within the recession period. Now, why did that happen? Some people think that it is because of the government policy. You know, uh, the ban, or the 41 list, you know, that the CBN uh, banned from the export window, men included most of those products, refined oil, TPO, and so on, that uh, companies had to uh, import from abroad. But because of that ban, they had to go in was, you know, uh, looking to companies like um, Presco and Okomo. But when I interviewed the CEO of uh, Presco, Mr. Felix Wabuko, he's of the view that, yes, the policy played a, a significant role in their, profit, in, in their profitability uh, in 2016. But it wasn't just that, okay? They, they've had a long-term strategy on plantation, increasing the size, the acreage of, of plantation. As at the time I interviewed him in, in, in January, Presco has about 40,000 hectares. That is their land bank. Uh, and they also, because it's owned by the uh, Bayesian group, the SEAT group, they also acquired the reason, former Reason Palm, which is now SEAT Nigeria Limited, and the man sits on top of both uh, companies. So for them, it is because of their long-term strategy, plantation acquisition, and so on. But most importantly, they've not been able to meet the local demand. Okay? On all the money they made, none came from the exports. In fact, they've not been playing in the export market. So they have off-take agreement with most of the major industrial FMCG uh, companies in Nigeria. So they're not exporting anything yet. So my take is that... Despite all the noise being made about agricultural transformation and so on, a lot still needs to be done in agriculture. 
okay, to really leverage the potentials of that sector to really, um, you know, uh, uh, give us an inclusive growth, as people uh, have been talking about. For the World Bank, Uh, GDP for Nigeria will grow to at least 2.5, uh, 2.5 percent in 2018, from 1 percent in 2017. Again, improve commodity prices, oil investments, and trade. Uh, stable oil produ uh, production, increasing spend in the run up to the general elections, of course, will help growth. But then, political uncertainty will weigh on foreign investment. This is the view of um, the World Bank. Then what are the domestic uh, trends that we need to be wary of in 2018? Now, a lot of things are happening in the world today. Um, the process of creative destruction. Some jobs, the in unemployment that we have in Nigeria, um, people report on the misery index, which is, uh, which is derived from unemployment, uh, rate and inflation. So adding inflation, analyze inflation rate to the unemployment rate, you get the misery index. Now, what is it telling us? Unemployment seems to be increasing on a daily basis in Nigeria. Many people are being turned out from the universities, but there are no jobs for them. And it's being driven, uh, not by economists, by the way, the guy who is leading this research is a physicist at MIT, Hidago. He's a physicist, but he's doing a whole lot of work in economic geography. So now he decomposes countries' uh, exports over the years. And then one thing you notice, countries that have unique, first of all, diversified product space, that's what he calls it, product space. That is what countries export to the rest of the world. Now, countries that have diversified product space also tend to have um, a preponderance of unique products. Now, that is products that other countries can't easily replicate. Okay? So, the combination of diversification of product space and the unicity of the products that countries export combine to drive down inequality within the countries. So what it means that when countries have concentrated product space, uh, let me go to the last slides. Uh, I'll come back so that I can drive home this, uh, this point. Okay. Now, this is Chile's export. Uh, this is 2012. Okay. Chile is less diversified than Malaysia. You can begin to see it. Now, the colors represent specific products. So you could say that half, more than half, like almost 70% of Chilean exports is made up of copper, copper oils. You can see that. Okay? Now, each square here represents other products that they export. Now, look at this. This is Malaysia. Can you see how diversified their product space is? And unemployment, I mean, uh, inequality in Malaysia is less than. 0.3. Now on the Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality, inequality from uh, 0 to 1. 1 is a position where one individual owns everything in the economy, and 0 is where income and resources is equally distributed. Right? That's what is called the Gini coefficient. So the Gini coefficient for Malaysia is 0 0.2 or thereabouts. For Chile, it's a Latin American country, you know that historically they've always had very high levels of uh, inequality. So in Chile, they have uh, a Gini coefficient of 0 0.6. In Nigeria, Gini coefficient is almost 0 0.8, very close to 1. And I think actually that could be an under, understatement because uh, was it last year or two years ago, um, I think Save the Child UK published a report which shows that um, the bank accounts Deposits in Nigerian banks owned by less than 2% of Nigerians. I don't know if you follow that statistics. All the money in the banks in Nigeria belongs to less than 2% of Nigerians. So talk about the, the champagne glass. Okay, 
So this is it. Now, this is what Nigeria exported in 1965. This is our product space in 1965. First of all, in terms of diversity, we are actually a little bit more diversified, but diversified in one region. Agricultural products mainly, natural resources and agriculture, primary products. Okay? So what, when you look at complexity, does it appear to be like complex products? What does it take to produce granite? Cheap level. What does it take to produce crude petroleum? Same thing, cocoa beans. There is no sophistication in our product space. But, it, but at least it was a little bit diversified. Now let's look at what it, we have in 2015. Now, this is raw data. You can check it online. Google Hidalgo, product space. Now, this is where we are today. Now, the research these guys have conducted, and I'm joining them in that research, is that when countries have this kind of undiversified product space, it is not possible to create an inclusive growth. So you have a growth system, an economic system, that is dominated by few few people. And that is why, you know, I, I wrote an article sometime last year. If, if you follow me, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I, I write a column for the Business Day, which I call Bongonomics, after my name. Now, I wrote something on the Federal, I titled the Federal Republic of Dangote. Yeah, I got a lot, a lot of uh, flag from so many people. Um, the Federal was uh, attacking Dangote's business and so on and so forth. No. I don't attack uh, businesses, I don't attack individuals. I was looking at institutional capture, okay? Monopoly and institutional capture. And then you could see how this kind of system creates giants, behemoths, like Dangote, right? Now, you, you have nothing to do about that. It is natural advantage, it's natural monopoly, the early bird advantage. And you begin to see more and more, in every sector, you're gonna see a dangote. Because of the system of the products, uh, our production space. So it is not by its own making, it's not by government creation, you are likely gonna see, because that is gonna be the sole way. Because if you look at the research over years, you see that it's going to be the only way that um, those institutional problems Okay, um, externality problems could be addressed. Because if you don't internalize them within companies, then they undermine your business. So the way to go is by, you know, broadening out, expanding, and so on and so forth. So that is the system of uh, economy that we have. Undiversified economy, um, not sophisticated economic, uh, or economic complex, complexity index is very is almost zero, zero point zero 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 something. Nigeria is the most undiversified economy in the world today. But the Republic is more diversified than us. Okay? Ghana is more diversified than us. In Africa, Nigeria is the most undiversified economy. Japan is the most diversified economy. Now this is the research I'm doing currently. So looking at the diversity, diversity index, it can, if, if you look at the, uh, what is called the viewed comparative advantage, so you can use that, use a, have a federal index to produce all this, and it's just pure statistics. Looking at what exports of countries, you work it out. So our economy is the most undiversified. And because we have a highly undiversified economic system, there is no way that you're gonna solve the problem of inequality. So you cannot have an inclusive growth. So the first step is, how do we begin to diversify the economy? Now, people have been saying this, I'm talking about this, and then we say that we can diversify into agriculture, we can do this. Now, before we think about diversification, we need to look, first of all, over time also, if you look at that product space, if you have a network, you know, graphic of the product space, what you notice is this, over time, countries tend to diversify along the areas where they have comparative advantage, okay? So, it never happens that you are an exporter of petroleum products, and then tomorrow, you become uh, uh, an exporter of hospital equipment. It doesn't happen. There is nothing connecting the two. 
Okay, so if you draw the linkages, wh where do you source the inputs and then the uh, human capital and so on? You cannot, co you cannot connect. There is no connected dots that will lead you from uh, petroleum to hospital equipment. So we can only um, diversify along the path that we've already established. It's called path dependence. So how do we leverage that? Now, last year, I think I read something when we do DOMA, I invited some Malaysians to begin to advise Nigeria on how to diversify the economy. Well, I found that very laughable. How will the Malaysians transfer their skills to you? So they forget about competitiveness and competition. Okay? Now, but be that as it may, I can understand. Malaysia was once like us. Okay? They were exporting, like in the, in the early 80s, Malaysia was exporting uh, primary commodities like Nigeria. But within the period of, like in the last 30 years, they've been able to diversify away from that. Okay? Yeah, that's okay. So they've been able to diversify away from export of primary uh, commodities, and they are into so many high-tech uh, uh, commodities, and then, of course, their income profile has risen. South Korea also. So, I can understand, maybe the Malaysians can teach us a thing or two about how to diversify the economy. But I think this is something that government needs to prioritize. Now that the oil price has bounced in the right territory, how do we begin to now, another thing I want to, which is not part of my presentation, because I have all this stuff here, you can look at it where you, where, if you care. I, I want to show something, because um, in the typical, I know that we can understand this simple GDP identity, that is uh, the output or GDP is a combination of uh, consumption plus investment plus government purchases and, and then net export. We are familiar with this. Okay, fine. Now, this is, I was asking, um, I don't know how that discussion came up. Some people were thinking that it is possible for Nigeria to embark on a consumption-led growth. It is not possible to embark on a consumption-led growth. It's not possible. China can do that, and that's what China is doing right now. Consumption-led growth, building, um, you know, um, raising consumption, profile of Chinese. But the first thing to ask is, where do they get the resources to embark on consumption-driven growth? So meaning that in the economic model that we have today, the structure of economic or economic development model, everything depends on this. Let's export. We can see it in Nigeria. Once our export of oil increases and the value increases, we are the recession. So meaning that what drives this economy is this net export. And the same goes for every economy in the world. So uh, yeah, in the empirical work, people have not been able to link, you know, the uh, cause, draw a causal link between uh, productivity and export. Some people have the view that export, manufacturing export, firm export drive productivity. Some other people are of the view that productivity uh, leads to export. That's exportability. But it doesn't matter whichever. All I know is that both productivity and export are interrelated. They are strongly correlated. When productivity increases, now productivity, of course, will lead eventually to competitiveness of your products. And if your product becomes competitive, Competitive means that they come at the lower, lower cost and higher quality in relation to other products. They are competitive. They can compete abroad. Then when that happens, you have, because of increased productivity, now productivity in economies, we define it as uh, output per unit of level. Okay? But that's just a crude definition of productivity. Now if you add quality elements to that, then we begin in it. So when you have a competitive product that can compete in the uh, foreign market, you begin to drive this. Okay? So now, we talk about the external reserve. 
It's still not resolved in Nigeria by the time Obasanjo left in 2007. I think our Estonia Reserve was around 69 billion or so. 62? Yeah, but in the 60s region, billion dollars. And that was good. And it was on that basis that um, uh, the rating agencies you know, started to rate the Nigerian economy, the banks, and so on. And then we became like, um, we started to talk about what do you call them now? Um, uh, what's that acronym? BRICS. Yeah. No, 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 we have the BRICS. And then we started to talk about the MINT. Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria. Today, nobody's talking about MINT again. It was because of the strength of our accumulated reserve. And what leads to the accumulation of the reserve? This, net export, this is it. So once this is doing good, everything changes about the economy of the country. So this is what I, you know, if we don't take anything home today, we take on this. Net export is important, what we are exporting. And then we have seen the export profile of Nigeria. The only thing we are exporting seems to be mainly crude oil. Okay, crude oil. So our country, the fortunes of this country de de depends, lies solely on what happens to the oil price. A call on Nigeria is a call on oil. How far can we sustain that? So this is quite important. So we can do anything. We can have investment, government cannot spend, people can consume if we are not getting it right here. Now, the question is, how do we drive this? Export made growth. Now, anybody can say anything. I haven't seen any country that emerged that grew in recent times, except it pursued an export-led growth. Think of Japan. Think of the famous uh, East Asian Tigers. The newly industrializing economies, NIEs of those days. All of them pursued export-led growth strategies. Did it deliver? Yes, it did. But then, what are the components of export-led growth? China today, or India. What's behind Chinese growth? Exports. What's behind Indian growth? Same thing. No country has grown by encouraging consumption. This is what happens after you've made the money. Then you can begin to redistribute it. So for me, consumption growth is a, is a redistributive policy. So without this, there is nothing in the economy again. And we have seen this playing out in Nigerian economy every time. So how do we boost our productivity and how do we um, diversify the economy? I think these are the two critical questions that I think we, we, we should be asking. Without finding answers to this, then I maintain that it is still business as usual. Yes, our foreign reserve is growing. As the last count, I think it's gone to about $40 billion from 20, down of 20s, so it's, which means this government is doing well in saving up for the rainy day. But that is not the end of it. Yes, we are accumulating a solar reserve. How do we diversify the economy? In Abuja, when I did this presentation, I told them, look, I'm not about talking about, you know, talking um, the economic outlook. I don't think there's any Nigerian that is not well informed on the economic dynamics in Nigeria. Each and every one of you seated here can as well make this presentation and talk about the economy. In fact, I don't know if there is anything that Nigerians are more versatile in more than economic analysis. Every Nigerian is an economic expert, okay? So there is nothing to be taught. There is nothing to teach anybody. But what has the, where the lacuna exists is the doing, okay? So we can talk. What can we do? What should we do to diversify the economy? We're talking about the challenges in the educational system. That's been ongoing for more than 20 years now. It didn't start today. What has been done? So, the question is, how does the corporate sector play? Now, um, it, was it uh, the Minister of Investment 
who said on Friday that they are committed to a private sector-led growth. It's no longer a matter of private sector creating jobs out there. The jobs will require human capital. Where will the human capital come from? Should we continue to export the little money that we have abroad, training our children? So people are talking of uh, health tourism. What about educational tourism? How much of our GDP is spent on foreign education? Why can't we get our universities right? What role should private sector play in revamping the, the educational system in Nigeria? First of all, uh, why do we go into recession when we stopped, when our export earnings dropped, the export revenue dropped? Okay, consumption was happening inside, but then driven mainly by what comes from abroad. So, yes, it is important, even in those countries, it's, uh, it's consumption, of course, uh, what is our export is domestic consumption for those countries, right? And our consumption could also be um, the export of those of foreign countries. That is, that, that's, uh, okay, I think um, that, that's very clear. But the issue here is um, the initial boost on productivity, okay, comes from the export earnings. And then if we, given this, like I said, this is the model of growth that we have today. And it's driven by the export sector. That's my, my thought and based on the research that I have conducted, it is driven by the export sector. The consumption, yes, is part of, the, of this, but it doesn't create sufficient multiplier effect in the system. So that's my, my take on this. Otherwise, um, when countries, let's say, okay, if we remove this, what we have is uh, an autarky, a country that's not trained with the rest of the world. Now, practically, is there any country that is autarkic? Some countries have tried it, but they didn't survive. North Korea, or even China, some time ago. But which other country? Is there any? Now, if you remove this also, you have a country that doesn't have government, like Somalia. Okay, so, yeah, we, we can have this. We, it has problems. Now, you have just this in the world today. But, um, again, as far as you have an external sector, that is thread. And the thread is fundamental to growth. So, these are the stylized facts. Uh, why I went into that, because there are those things that are not here. Um, we, we know all these things, crude oil price over the years, uh, 2014 to last quarter of 2017, okay, so from 2014 it was 98, then the average, the annual average. If you take the annualized um, prices, it didn't go down that much, okay. I know that there was a time in 2016 when it went to like 20 something dollars. But then if you take the annual average, it came to this, and then we ended up here. Then this is the domestic oil production, which we are all familiar with. So our production has, uh, well, again, annualized, didn't go down so much. The lowest we had was in 2016, 1.5 million barrels a day, and then um, now it's about 1.7 to 2 point something million barrels. I think 2 million or very close. That's what we have currently. And then the standard results build up currently, I think, is about $40 billion. And then this is the exchange rate. Starting from 2016, when it hit uh, to the dollar, 500 at a point, and then continue. And then, then we had, um, um, there was a tumult, a chaos in the foreign exchange market. But today, of course, from the beginning of last year, CBN started to intervene in the market, and then there seems to be a, some bit of harmony in that market currently. Now, this is investment, which I've spoken about. Portfolio investment increased from 2016 to 2017 was 93%. Um, 
direct investment, which I've spoken about, dropped by 19% between 2016 to 2017. And I've asked, why do you think that is happening? Again, you can connect that to the economic environment of business in Nigeria. Then total market capitalization, you see what's been going on in the stock market. It's been uh, bouncing up in the, in the bullish region in recent times. So between 2016 and 2017, we have 22%. Then government budget deficit as a percent of uh, GDP. 2016, uh, we have 2.2, 2.1, 1.7 in 2018. Debt to GDP ratio, 16, 18, 19. So another word on, on the debt to GDP ratio, OK? Um, I am of the opinion that debt to GDP ratio is not a good statistics. It doesn't tell us anything, OK? We don't sell our GDP, do we? It's just a market value of final goods and services produced in an economy within a year. That's what we have as GDP. So the percentage of debt to that GDP mm, doesn't help us very much. OK, if you look at uh, debt to our revenue, then it begins to make sense. Because it begins to tell us our ability to service our debt. And then um, last year, it was actually bad. Because uh, according to uh, IMF, 60 Kobo of every Naira was used to service debt, which is quite bad. OK? Um, but again, so looking at debt to GDP, like I said, it's not a good statistics. It doesn't help you to understand much. Because the United States has a G debt to GDP uh, ratio of almost 200 and something percent. China has 300 and something percent at a point. India also had very high GDP, uh, debt to GDP. But the economies have not collapsed. OK? But again, I think it has to do with the sustainability. So people are of the opinion that we, we can still, we still have some headroom to borrow. OK. So that's not the problem. It's the, I think uh, the concern should be on what the borrowing is directed to. Then this is the revenue over time. Then prices and consumption, the NPR has um, been on the same level over the years uh, for almost 18 months from November 2016 to this moment. It's been 14 percent. Now, uh, well, we expect that as inflation is going down, then maybe sometime this year the government will be forced to, but again, it's a dilemma. Why do I think so? Because this is the benchmark rate. So given that is a, well, call it the hodl rate, the benchmark rate of borrowing or interest rate, government has been borrowing very high, crowding out pri uh, private investment over the years, few, uh, since we went into recession. Treasury bills have been dropping, but at the point, um, government bonds were up to 19%. I suppose. OK? So the government borrowed at that rate. And then if they reduce this, I don't know what the implication will be. So what do we expect to, uh, to happen? This, what we expect to happen over time is that given a drop in inflation, um, we can also see that uh, inflation, um, interest rates will follow that trend. But again, Government borrowed heavily at 19%. So except we pray that oil price continue to go up so that government could have the, the resources, the revenue, the funds to uh, create the buffer for that if uh, rates should go down. Then unemployment rates, yeah, this is 18.9%, but my take is that this is underreported. Um, why do I say so? There's a whole lot of these guys on employment in the system masquerading as unemployment. So this, all these come up as employment. But if you put these guys on employment, uh, this will go up to almost 40% based on what we observe. 
So policies and designs that we shape 2018, I think I lifted this from the Nigeria Economic Summit, implementation of business reforms, 2019 elections, government spending relating to elections will increase. Uh, that is, uh, all, that always happens. Uh, favorable global oil market outlook, growth and monetary policy development in advanced countries such as the US, as I mentioned in the beginning. Fiscal policy, budget processes and implementation, delayed passage of the 2018 budget. Now, this is another problem. Uh, we are still on 2017 budget. I think uh, capital budget started around what time? October last year. So I think that is a bigger problem with our fiscal policy. So 2018 budget has in common stream. And this is the question I've always been asking. Where do we stand to lose? What's the trade-off? Rather than going on this annual budget ritual, what will happen if we have like a four-year budget? I think it's something that I want us to engage with. You know, people may intervene if you're an accountant or something. What will be the consequence for the economy? What is the implication? Why can't we go for four-year budget? Now, 2018, February, first quarter, we soon go. We are still on 2017 budget. And then we are fighting over 2018 budget appropriation and so on. So rather than having this annual ritual, can't we have a single four-year budget? I know there was a time, well, those were development plans. The five-year development plans and so on and so forth. The, the long, long gone are those days. So keep the advice of Nigerian sentiments um, in 2018, reduction of logistics and distribution costs, tank farms, refining pipelines, food storage, packaging, and distribution used for local input for processing tomatoes and so on and so forth. Um, 2018 indicator signals. Now, post-recession GDP growth passed since 1978. This is not the first time we had um, in, um, recession. Um, in 1978, if you look at the, the path of recovery, you can see it's a little bit steep, fast, but the path to recovery, the red line, the 2015-2016 recession, you can see that it's very flat. Why this flatness? Why is the recovery very slow? So, your guess is as good as mine. I think that has to do with government policies in general. The response, the responsiveness of the government to the key macroeconomic issues have not been um, as expected. So, the GDP growth, the growth recovery to continue, yeah? The advice of growth agriculture, recovery in oil production and revenue, infrastructure development. But growth will remain below levels needed to boost job creation. I think that's um, a no-brainer. Average standard of living to continue to remain quite poor. So, um, now to outperform the GDP, we have manufacturing, Agriculture, the telcos, education, financial services, flats, petroleum building materials trade, lagging real estate. Again, uh, I think this is because of the lag effect in growth. Inflation NPL will decline by 20 basis points by quarter two to quarter three. Consumer price inflation will trend towards to 14 percent in quarter one before reversing to 15 percent. Headline inflation has been going down, but it is important for us to know that food inflation has remained quite high. Okay, um, one of the reasons for the um, lack of impact on the food inflation is simp uh, some people think that um, because of our exchange rate, so it's becoming cheaper for our neighboring countries, you know, to buy up the food, you know, products in the northern part of Nigeria. So that's creating a whole of competition for food. So that is driving up the price in food. That is the major reason. The velocity of circulation will spike as we expect a 40 to 50% increase in electronic payments away from cash. Minimum wage increase of 77% to 32,000. That's still being discussed. Knock on effect on average wages will be approximately 25%. Exchange rate pass through will push up retail prices by at least 2%. Money supply, broad money supply is expected to grow by 7.2% in 2018. 
from an analyzed negative growth of 5.54% uh, in 2017, driven by increased government spending, election funds, social intervention programs. Um, well, with NPR declining, then Treasury bill stop rates for 90 to 180 day will be 10 to 11 percent per annum. It's going to, it's always trending, almost trending towards this at the moment. Average effective lending rates to prime corporates 18 percent per annum. Average deposit rates and interbank rates will decline by 400 basis points to 11 to 13 percent per annum, leading to negative real interest rates of 1 to 2 percent. Lower interest rates will pop up the stock market after a sharp correction. A wave of corporate bond issues with coupon rates to 5 to 10 percent. Uh, five to ten year bonds are ten to fourteen percent, and so on. Um, the exchange rate value of the Naira market structure will remain a price accumulating monopoly. Yep, CBN, yeah, that's what has uh, been happening with the investor export exporter window. CBN, the price level with, with strong external reserve, which is enough to fight uh, the currency battle. Positive oil flows, ten billion per quarter. What are two negative flows by fixed investors as interest rates decline and U.S. interest rates increase? Election uncertainty will increase risk premium. The P purchasing power parity value of the Naira today is 335.47. The investor exporters window will remain a reference price for price discovery, declining to $370 uh, dollar in quarter four. Naira per dollar. The seller reserve currently $40 billion. Stable oil price and production. Increased intervention in, in the uh, second half of the year will cause a depletion. Uh, this is the state of the stock market in uh, 2018. Equities market to hold upper hand in capital market tozo. Market will be driven by slow economic recovery and political populist spending. Market will continue to experience progress and means a positive outlook for FX earnings. Strong equity market performance in 2018 with an estimated um, Full year return of 15% uh, um, to 20%. First, let's passage of the 2017 budget. As I said, we are still on the 2017 budget cycle at the moment. Uh, creation of the ERG DP, uh, GP implementation unit, the economic recovery and growth plan. Uh, that is the emphasis of the government currently. Um, the ERGP, it is interesting for us to note that um, it is actually pulled out from the National Integrated Infrastructure Master Plan of the last administration and the National uh, Industrial Revolution Plan. So put together, they are finding a way to begin to uh, implement them uh, uh, gradually into the system. Uh, the new Niger Data New Vision, exchange rate reforms, Ease of doing business reforms and so on. So this is what uh, happened in 2017. Policy drivers for 2018, three main considerations, uh, the political experience, economic necessity or imperative, materially confident. Many response to electoral pressure. Um, Obasanjo's letter seems to have actually, you know, uh, driven s some things to action. Emboldening opposition forces to accumulate lead to greater transparency in public sector. GDP growth to spark to at least 2.5 percent in 2018 for 1 percent. Okay, so no change in subsidy arrangements. Political expedient. Uh, oil swap arrangements to remain. Keep tariffs, minimum wage review, and so on and so forth. Challenges and uh, opportunities: aviation, real estate, um, a proper grid lock. The sector outlook, uh, manufacturing projected to grow by 1% in 2018, benefiting from salary areas and wage increment, more firms will move to hedge against FX volatility, more rights issue to reduce finance costs. But again, it's not going to help much except the infrastructure situation improves. Sector growth to be driven by FMCG sector, decline in import bill. That's import substitution sector to benefit from payment of salary areas, higher disposable income, more fence we hedge against FX volatility, and so on. Uh, the brewing industry, oil and gas. Um, I think I've run out of time. So some puzzles, medium term risks, oil price below 48 uh, price per barrel, what will be the implication? If there is a resurgence in militant activities, 
what will be the implication for the economy. If there will, of course, this will lead to foreign strategies. Uh, policy is politicization of economic policy, policy backsliding, reactive rather than strategic policies, political risk, land dock status, party squabbles, premature transfer of power, institutional risk, constitutional crisis and clashes, industrial action, social restiveness. Okay, uh, this was the, the slide I was looking for, showing you that the Nigeria economy, bottom five countries by economic complexity. Nigeria, Turkmenistan, Guinea, Angola, Libya. These are the least complex economies, most undiversified economy. The most diversified economies are the five above, Japan, Switzerland, Germany, Sweden, South Korea. Um, I think um, that is pretty much what we have. Thank you very much.